Some of the most important things for me when choosing the right camera to work with are adaptability, versatility and ease of use. And those are some of the reasons why I chose the Canon C7D as my main camera for almost all of my jobs. But to make my life even easier, especially for documentary and run and gun work, I had to switch some of the custom buttons around as well as change some of the settings. And in this video, I will share this custom button layout with you, explain why I mapped it a certain way, as well as go over all the settings that I've changed in the camera, the codecs that I've used, etc. And also tell you why I did it. And now, without wasting any more time, my name is Steven Cooper and welcome to Monkey Pixels. <laughs> Initially I wanted to upload one video with all my custom button layouts as well as all of my settings for the Canon C70 but while editing I decided that the video was way too long so I split it into two so if you haven't watched my video about the custom button layout yet I suggest you do this after this video and now let's go back to the settings video. On our very first menu page I made two changes. Number one I changed the iris increments from one half to one third because Therefore, I have a lot more fine tuning and options. And the second thing I chose was on the bottom, the extended ND range, and I turned it on because that way it gives us all the way up to 10 stops of ND. On page two, the shutter mode is always set to angle when I'm shooting because that makes it so much easier because when I now use my quick assign buttons to change the frame rate, it automatically changes the shutter. So I don't have to worry about this and it's always set right. ISO gain stays at ISO at all times because for me, this is just the way easier way of using using instead of gain. ISO extended range you can also turn on. I usually never shoot at the extended range so I just keep it at the normal range but if you're a low light shooter and you need this extra range of ISO then go ahead and turn that on as well. Same as with the iris I also like to have more control over my ISO settings so it's set to one third instead of one full stop. On page four, we have our autofocus settings and here I changed it a little bit. So the autofocus mode is always in continuous mode because I'm a filmmaker and I want my focus to be continuous at all time. When it comes to the autofocus frame of the Canon C70, I use the whole area about 98% of the times. And then I just circulate, as I already said, between face only and face priority. But usually, especially when shooting on a gimbal, I just let the camera choose its focus and it works most of the times. Autofocus speed and autofocus response I usually have at zero unless I find myself in a situation where I'm shooting some sports and I feel like the autofocus needs to be a little quicker or sometimes it's even too quick then I just start experimenting with the settings but most of the times I just leave it at zero. On page number five I usually don't change anything and I usually make adjustments via custom buttons 11 and 12 as I've shown you before but when I do so I have my eye detection enabled as after the last firmware update. Menu page number six, I leave it just as is. Sometimes I do an automatic black balancing, but I rarely do this and I leave everything else the same. When it comes to lens correction, I usually don't use it unless I have a really special lens that needs some correcting, but even then I usually leave most of the stuff off. But one thing I do change from time to time is the digital image stabilization. And here it really depends on the style of shooting. When running and gunning and I'm using a lens where I have to walk handheld after some people. I sometimes do use it, but beware, it sometimes messes up your shot. So I use this with caution and I rarely use it at all. When it comes to the color profiles, I use this camera about 99.9% .9 of the times in the same color profile. And that is a mixture of Canon Log 2 in the Cinema Gamut style with neutral color metrics. In my recording and media setup page, on page number one, here is what I have my settings set to. My sensor mode is usually always set to super 35 millimeters unless I want 180 frames, then I set it to the 16 millimeter to enable the 180 frames. When it comes to my main codec, I used all of the codecs and compared them side by side and I decided that for 99% of my project, the MP4 HEVC with a 422 10-bit color space is the right choice for me. In most cases, I just can't take advantage of the raw recording and it just takes up way too much space on my memory card and therefore the MP4 is just a better choice. When it comes to MP4 versus XFABC, it's a close race, but in my opinion, the MP4 prevailed. Not only do the files run a little bit better on older computers than the XFABC, but when shooting vertically, it automatically rotates the files when importing them to the Mac, whereas the XFABC doesn't, and you have to rotate them manually, but you can't even do so in the Finder because the macOS Finder doesn't recognize the files as well as it does the MP4 files. 
My main resolution is usually set to 3840 times 2160 and this is because all of my export settings are usually in somewhat of a fraction of 3840. When I'm delivering to YouTube, I have a 2 to 1 aspect ratio, meaning 3840 times 1920. When I'm delivering in 16 to 9, I have 3840 times 2160. And when I'm shooting anamorphic and I want to have a 2.5 to 1 aspect ratio, I'm usually using 3840 times 1600. So for me, there's no need to use the full width of the sensor and shoot 4096 times 2160. In tab number 2, I usually have it set to normal recording most of the times, but when using the higher frame rates, 100 frames and above, I am in slow and fast recording mode. In tab number three, the only thing that I change from time to time is I switch the second card recording function to double slot recording. So if I'm shooting an important interview or basically any kind of client work, I have two of the same cards in both of the memory slots and I choose double slot recording. So if one of my card fails, I still have all the footage on the other card. Beware that this doesn't work when shooting at higher frame rates like 100 frames and above and then it switches automatically to only record on one card slot and that has messed up our shoot in the past because sometimes we were thinking that both cards are absolutely identical but they weren't so we were copying footage over from one card whereas the other card was holding information that the other card didn't so beware when switching to higher frame rates it automatically switches to single card slot recording tab number four i don't really use metadata so i left everything as it was now let's go to the audio setup menu and here it's a little bit more complicated because it really depends on the scenario that i'm using and which kind of microphone i have attached to my camera when we go to the audio input selection i usually change the following things channel three and four i usually set to the built-in microphone and therefore i record scratch audio at all times so if my main audio fails i can always use the second one or when i'm recording talking heads like this i only use the scratch audio on my canon c70 and then sync it up to my audio recorder that i'm recording my audio into However, when I'm shooting a documentary or running gun style with a shotgun microphone attached to my camera, I have it set up a little bit differently. First of all, channel one and two are linked and channel three and four are linked as well. Now all of my channels are using the input terminals. And now we can go to the second tab of the audio setup and here we can make some changes. I set the audio recording level of channel three and four to manual and then I changed the levels to be a lot less than channel one and two. And therefore I just have my channel one and two audio at the exact audio where I want to record my audio with but I have a safety channel that records at a much lower volume. So for example, you record somebody at the regular voice and then they start laughing, screaming or something else loud happens in the background, then you can always fall back to your safety channel three and four, which is also using your shotgun microphone, but at a much lower input level. Tab number three and four, I just leave as is. In tab number five, there's a cool thing after the latest firmware update where we can now monitor all four channels at the same time. So when I am shooting with a shotgun microphone and I have my safety channels enabled, I also want to display channel three and four so I can see that I am in fact recording at a lower level and even that is not peaking when there's something loud happening. So now let's go to the monitoring setup. When it comes to the internal LCD, I usually don't change anything, but I also rarely use the internal LCD. And when shooting with the Canon C70, most of the times I'm using an external HDMI monitor. Tab number two is dedicated to anamorphic shooting. And I've been shooting a little bit more anamorphic lately. So this comes in really handy because here you can already set your monitor to the certain squeeze factor of your anamorphic lens. And that depends on which anamorphic lens you have. Tab number three, I don't change anything. Tab number four, I always have the OCD output for HDMI enabled. Unless I live stream and I use the HDMI to live stream, then you should take it off because otherwise it will show up in the live stream. In tab number five, I usually don't change anything unless I'm shooting vertically because then we have the option to change the direction of our internal LCD and therefore change the OSD to our vertical shooting. And we can go all the way down and set it from zero degrees to 90 degrees or 270 degrees, depending on which way you mount your camera. Tab number six is dedicated to the tele lamp while recording. I usually have this on because I'm not filming anyone without their knowledge, but I bet there are situations where I want that lamp to not show up while I'm recording. 
Tab number seven is a little bit more interesting because now we're talking about how we display our image on our LCD as well as on our HDMI monitor. The LUT is always enabled on my LCD because otherwise I would be just looking at a lock footage screen and that would make it very hard for me to judge my focus as well as exposure. However, the interesting part is that the camera is not using the same LUT that it is using for the LCD screen when we want to display it onto our HDMI monitor. And I have no idea why that is. But you can clearly tell that if you enable the view assist on your external monitor, it is a different kind of LUT and it overexposes your image and it makes it hard to judge it fairly. So this is why I always keep the view assist for the HDMI monitor off and I customly load a LUT on top of my external monitor and that is the same LUT that I also use when grading my footage and you can find it on the Canon website and I will put down a link in the description below. So remember, stay away from the view assist because the view assist is not the same as the LUT. Tab number eight, I just leave as is. So now let's talk a little bit about the assistant functions. In tab number one, when I'm focusing manually, I always like to have the focused guide on because most of the times it's actually working quite well and it is a huge advantage when focusing manually. When it comes to displaying the peaking on the LCD and the HDMI screen, I usually use my custom button and I'm not fiddling in the menu with that. And when it comes to which kind of peaking I'm using, I usually use peaking number two that is already predetermined in camera. And that is a red colored peaking and I use that 95% of the times unless I'm filming something with a lot of red tones, then I'm usually switching to either yellow or white and I have that custom mapped to peaking number one. As already talked about when I'm setting my custom buttons, I do use magnification a lot of the times, so I just leave it to my custom button number eight instead of fiddling in the menu. As I've already mentioned, I don't use zebras, so I leave tab five alone. The waveform monitors I enable via my custom button. I didn't change any of the settings in that menu and I suggest you don't do so either. In tab number seven, I also leave everything as it already was. Tab number eight is really personal preference. If you want to have a center marker or not, some people are irritated by it and some people like to use it to always know where the center of your image is. I do it sometimes and sometimes I have it off. When it comes to a grid, I usually like to having a grid on my screen, but I usually use the one that comes with my external monitor and not the internal one, but that is also personal preference. Tab number nine is dedicated to aspect markers, and this is something that I use all the time, because as I've already mentioned briefly, I export to different kind of formats. Sometimes I use 16 by nine, sometimes for YouTube I use two to one, and for other projects, maybe I wanna shoot at a 2.4 to one. So here I usually have my aspect marker on and I set it to a mask of 70% overlay, and then I can just either use one of the custom presets or you can make a custom preset, which I usually do for YouTube when delivering in two to one, and set it that way. And this helps a lot by framing your shot, especially when filming yourself and you wanna know that the microphone is out of the way, then this makes a lot of sense to have this enabled. And I use this all the time. Tab number 10, I leave everything as is and I don't meddle with that one either. Same is true for tab number 11, I never changed anything here. In the network settings in the menu, I've never changed anything because I never connected the camera via network to anything to remote control. If you want to do so, then you would need to change some settings in here. But again, I have never done so. We have already talked about all the assignable buttons, so we can skip that entire menu as well. In our settings tab under number one, you obviously put in your time zone, your preferred language, etc., And that is pretty much accustomed to where you are and your personal preferences. Under system setup tab number two, I usually don't change anything but if I want to live stream with my camera then sometimes you might need to change some frequencies but usually the people that do the live streaming for you will tell you exactly what they need for the specifications. Under tab number three since I use timecode a lot I do make one change and that is that I change my timecode run to free run instead of preset. We've already been over tab number four in the system setup so I will leave that one out as well. Tab number five I never changed anything. I leave everything under tab number six as well. Tab number seven, all as is. When it comes to number eight, I usually leave the fan in always on because it never has been an issue for me, but you can also set it to automatic if you want to. But for me, always on has never been an issue when recording audio. Under tab number nine, I leave everything as it already was too. 
And this is it for all the settings that I have changed and use frequently on my Canon C70. So there you have it. This was my in-depth video on all the custom buttons and all the settings that I use for video on my Canon C70. If you have any more questions to any of the settings or custom buttons, just leave a comment down below. I hope you liked this video and if you did, then please give it a thumbs up, subscribe for more, and since you're already here, maybe why don't you just check out two more videos about the Canon C70 that I recorded recently to learn even more about this amazing camera. My name is Damien Cooper and I hope to see you on the next one.